delighted to be joined, first of all, by a very dear friend of mine, uh, Lord Digby Jones. There he is. Digby's the former boss of the CBI. He was a minister in Gordon Brown's government. He put together more mergers and acquisitions in the Midlands in the past than you've had uh, hot dinners. Uh, and he is now a cross-bench working peer. Uh, Digby, great to, uh, to see you. Can I put something uh, right at the very top to you? Because Stephen Dorrell, who I know you know, former health secretary, but also former treasury minister back in the John Major days, said he was deeply and profoundly worried about one thing in this budget more than anything else, and it's sound money, borrowing, devaluing the pound, and we've seen that overnight. What do you reckon? I, th I think that's the big risk. The, the, if, you, if you look at uh, uh, Anthony Barber's budget in 72, and Alistair, you and I are probably old enough to remember that. Most of the viewers of this uh, excellent programme aren't. And, and so uh, forgive me for one minute of uh, refreshment. Ted Heath was Prime Minister and his Chancellor, Anthony Barber, did exactly what Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng are doing. They, they decided to get out of the malaise. They would cut so many taxes and at the same time go for growth and borrow. Um, it, it was brought down primarily by the oil crisis of 73, 74, when oil rocketed, inflation followed it, just like now. Nothing's very new in this world, Alistair. And at the end of the day, you got to, um, you got to the position where in 75, 76, inflation was at 25%. Look at an, um, Nigel Lawson, 88, 89, so-called Lawson boom, cut capital gains tax, cut income tax. Uh, by 91, he got a, a smallish, to be fair to him, but nevertheless a recession. So, so you, it, it, you, you lay yourself vulnerable to overseas events. As Macmillan said all those years ago, events, dear boy, events, and, and things you can't do anything about. And at the moment, there are two or three things out there that the British government can do precious little about. Putin and that whole relevance of that to oil and gas and energy prices being the biggest one. But you've got an America that doesn't really know where it's going, and it's a massive customer and big investor. And you've got a Brexit that has yet to be... Oh, if you're a Brexiteer, yet to be capitalised upon. If you're a Remainer, it, you've got a Brexit, oh, oh hell. So at the end of the day, the sound money risk is that the growth that will happen without doubt, if you drop all these taxes, you will definitely get growth. But at what price for the overseas markets who think, can I invest in Britain? Is my money safe? Yeah. And they're very prey to overseas happenings and events. Absolutely. And Digby beautifully put, uh, and that interest rate thing that Digby was talking about and that I was talking about right at the beginning is simply the price, the risk price that the city and the institutions charge people who want to borrow. And Digby put it utterly brilliantly there. Yeah, yeah. It is, there is one point to mention, as to, uh, which is this price that we pay. But the one benefit we get from this, and this doesn't fit well, with the left, it doesn't fit well with unions, it doesn't fit well with a lot of journalists, is that financial services is about 12% of our GDP. Mm. It's about 12% of what you might call the sales revenue of the nation. Yeah. And it's about 10% of the tax that's raised. Now, in, in, in financial services, it's a global business. It's hugely global. And we will beat Paris and Frankfurt. I'm not overly worried about that. But being in the EU meant you couldn't pay yeah. what you wanted to pay. It's New York that's the problem because Wall Street definitely has, has the lead. And we've got to attract more international overseas investment into London in financial services if we're going to keep generating the tax, which at the end of the day will help the lower paid. And yeah. I am fed up of hearing, and you've heard it tonight, uh, this, today on your programme, I am fed up of it saying, work, hearing the words working people. So for some reason, if you earn over, shall we say, 50, 75 grand a year in this country, for some reason you don't work anymore. It just falls off trees. And it's only people who belong to trade unions in the public sector who are workers. It's beyond belief. I thought, I really thought that we'd grown up and got over that, but clearly not. <laughs> I love it when you. I love it when you're on a roll. Uh, that, I, I, I've known you and Pat long enough to know that you are a man of principle uh, and of values. And I know that you believe passionately uh, that even those people that you're talking about who are earning good and very, very good money should only get it uh, if they deserve it.
But do, I, I'd love to know your take on the bankers' bonuses. That ceiling was lifted because it was imposed by the EU. And as you rightly said a moment, Brexit still to be capitalised upon. That is a good example of what can now be done. But it's playing so badly amongst the media, even the impartial media, that it verges on the inept. Is it a price worth paying as a part of a growth package to say, oh, yeah, and if you're in the city uh, and you're earning a million quid a year, you can earn five million. It just doesn't play well. No, I mean, it, it, the, the upside is that it doesn't... Uh, it does attract more talent into the financial services. By the way, I haven't heard a single commentator say that it means footballers get more money. But for some reason, they're fine, because they only get a million quid a week. <laughs> but it's, it, the optics of this is awful. Yeah. And I've believed all my life in what I would call socially inclusive wealth creation, that business is this agent in our society that creates wealth, that generates jobs, that generates profit from which you pay tax either by employing people who pay tax or paying it yourself. Now, that model is, in my view, fine if you take the whole of society with you, i.e. socially inclusive. And in one way, I think this government have made a mistake by saying the taxpayer generally will pay the gap on this energy subsidy, if you like, with an energy cap. It should be a, 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 a windfall tax on the energy people because at the end of the day, they are trousering profit unconscionable and i believe passionately that you're entitled to a profit but not where you haven't earned it where all you've done is sit there and it's fallen in your lap and yeah. it should be they who pay it and the other one is these bonuses that, to which you refer and it's not only lousy politics because you've just written Keir starmer's candidacy speech haven't you you've just said these guys come in here and the general taxpayer would have got more tax cuts at the bottom end if we hadn't done that he might be factually wrong it's not the point. It's lousy politics from the Tories. And, and I, I don't believe at this moment it was the right time to do that. Final point, and you've got just under a minute. Forgive me, Digby, but you're welcome back any time, as you well know. Final point, the Digby Jones scorecard on what I would call the supply side measures about investment zones, about making it more attractive for folk to come in, um, free ports and stuff. You've put together, as I said, mergers and acquisitions coming out of your ears. Have we just yesterday made the United Kingdom a more attractive place, not just to invest financially in, but to invest physically in, if you're in France, Germany or the United States of America? Definitely, yes. I'd say two things. One... We, what it really helped was get what... They, we, there are two infrastructures in this country, the physical infrastructure, roads, energy, ports, everything to which you, you referred, including, of course, in housing, that's planning, that's stamp duty, lots of things. And the second infrastructure is people and to skill them, to get an environment where people have skills and they can actually be more productive, earn more money for themselves. I presume then they stop being a worker, according to trade union, but nevertheless, <laughs> earn some money for themselves and at the end of the day, make the nation wealthier. That's the first point. The second point is, Alistair, thank you for asking me back on. <laughs> to you and Sally, I wish you all the very best in the world.